Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, let's begin today's class with a word of prayer. Uh, could one of us please lead us in prayer, please? Uh, Rose, is it okay if you can lead us in prayer? Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Father in heaven, all glory and praise and honor to you. Father, we thank you for this another time and opportunity that we can talk about you. We can know more about your ways in this world. Father, instill into us your word and guide us, Father, through the words that you supply through Pastor Paul. Father, anoint your words that you speak through Pastor Paul. And Father, let your words be instilled in our hearts and let them grow to fruition, Father, so, so they may grow fruit 30, 60, and some even a hundredfold. Make our hearts be prepared, Father, let them be fertile soils. In this season of you teaching us, help us to grow more in holiness, more in godly wisdom, and more in godly character. We ask this all in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Rose. All right. Uh, so yesterday we completed our uh, chapter five, where we looked at all the revival stories. We looked at a few reflections. We looked at how what worked for them, where they failed, and yet how God was moving through these simple people. God just looked at their hunger. God answered their prayers and many lives were touched through these great revivals. So we come to a halt in that. I'm sure we all have learned many things, uh, many takeaways in our spirit. Uh, so let's move on to chapter six. Now that we have learned everything like from, you know, uh, the first century church to now, uh, we will look at the church right now, the restoration of the church. Right, in chapter 6. So I'm on page 76. We'll start off with reading Lamentations chapter 5 and verse 21. Lamentations 5 and 21. I'll just read that. Turn us back to you, O Lord, and we will be restored. Renew our days as of old. Now, the writer on Lamentations is saying, Lord, turn us back to you so that we will be restored, right? So even in the Old Testament, when we look, uh, you know, at uh, how how God brought the people out of Egypt and all the things that the uh, Israelites did, somewhere along the way, they, they went off guard, right? And so they're praying, God, restore us back to those times when we, you know, look to you when we worshiped you when we uh, you know even as they gave those offerings and sacrifices as a as a pleasing aroma to god restore us back to that time you know especially nowadays when we look at the church when i say church i'm talking about the body of christ all across the world there are places where god is moving powerfully there are places where uh, in the church sadly needs restoration in the sense that there has been wrong teachings. Uh, you know, leaders haven't been up to the mark, meaning they have been uh, doing the wrong things, uh, taking the you know sheep astray, using uh, the church members, and, and so many things uh, are going wrong right now. So one of the prayers that we as believers always do and always make is God restore us. One thing that we can pray is say, God restore us to the church, like in the first century church, where they moved with signs, wonders, and miracles. They put aside every uh, you know, personal agendas and their main agenda was to bring glory to God. So we're gonna look at four points today on what we need restoration for in the church. Right. So in your notes, it's there. The first one, restoration in understanding spiritual truth, restoration in the wineskin to contain new wine, restoration in God's people pursuing God's purpose, 
restoration in the church impact on the world. Right. So we look at each point now. The first one, restoration in understanding spiritual truth. All across the world, in, in, in churches, many teachings are going on, right? Uh, and, and sometimes what happens is there will be wrong teachings or wrong doctrines and dogmas that come into the church. Now, one, one of the recent ones that I heard of, I will leave the person unnamed, but he was, he's a very, very famous preacher. Very famous preacher. He's got his own Bible college and all of it. Um, and I read his books. I still listen to his sermons because he's a powerful teacher and a preacher of the, of the word of God. There was this, uh, you know, these question and answer sessions. And uh, one of the questions was uh, basically in the in the interview, he's answering questions that were posted on uh, probably Instagram or Twitter and all of that. So one of the questions was, do you believe in rapture? And this wonderful, great man, the teacher, uh, a great teacher, wonderful teacher, great expository teaching of the word of God. He says, no, I don't believe in the rapture. Right now, the first time I I heard it, I I thought to myself, why? You know, why why? You know, he's such a wonderful man of God, but somewhere along the line, uh, you know, we the mark has been missed. So it's very important that as a body of Christ. We need restoration. Now, there are hundreds of and thousands of maybe millions of people around the world who are listening to him. Right? Hundreds of people come every year and join his Bible college. Right? Now, I'm, we're not putting him down, but what I'm trying to do is I'm bringing out the truth. Now, what's going to happen is millions of people are watching this. They look up to this wonderful man of God, and he says there is no rapture. So the spiritual truth is lost there. Right? And, and many of the uh, you know, believers around the world will believe what he said because he's a wonderful man of God, a wonderful teacher. So as a church, now this is just one, one example. There are plenty of examples. There are churches that don't believe in speaking in tongues. There are ministries that uh, don't, you know, don't prefer women to preach. Women are not allowed to preach. Uh, so a lot of these you know, uh, spiritual truths that are happening in the church. Now, this is where we need restoration. We need to understand truth. We need to understand the word of God in light and context to what it's being said and read. Right? The moment we look at the word and we put a wrong context to it, we will, we will, immediately diverge from the truth. So as a church, we need to have restoration in understanding spiritual truth. Right? There's another wonderful man of God, a wonderful preacher, great ministry. Now, I'm not going to name them, uh, but I was listening to a sermon and I was making notes. This was probably a couple of years ago. And as I was making notes, he was talking about how David and Jonathan uh, and how, you know, uh, God brought Jonathan into David's life. And, and somewhere along the sermon, as I was listening, uh, he said, you know, actually, David and Jonathan were not friends. They were enemies. And I was listening to the sermon. I thought, well, okay, what's happening? And he says that three out of four times uh, when David was hiding, only Jonathan knew where he was. And so it was most probably that Jonathan went and said, uh, you know, informed King Saul, his father, that David is hiding here. Now, that is not the truth, right? Uh, we know that David and Jonathan were good friends. They, uh, had, they were in one, in unity with each other. Uh, but here's the thing. These are big churches, big ministries, going global. Uh, and so we need the right truths to be revealed, right to truths to be taught in the church, right? Uh, we see that uh, through the centuries, the church's understanding of spiritual truth has really progressed, right? Now, 
10 years before or, or, or 15 years uh, ago, prophecies were very few people, right? There were very few people who would prophesy or prophets would come in, very few people. But now we see that in the church, not only the leaders, but even believers, just regular believers, lay uh, people in the church are prophesying. They're speaking in tongues. They are, they're flowing in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They're flowing in word of knowledge, word of wisdom. So we see that the church is progressing. Uh, yet we need to come to this place of understanding spiritual truth uh, in its accuracy. Right? Now, for example, if we look at revelations, right? uh, some of our church folks, uh, you know, uh, young men, and even some older men, and women, uh, they, they came up to me and said, uh, is this a tribulation? Now, we heard a few sermons saying this is a tribulation. Uh, so my answer to that was no, because uh, we know that in the tribulation, this is nothing, this, this is luxury. During the tribulation, we will see intense persecution. So uh, what I'm trying to get at is, even as we as leaders and preachers, pastors, as we begin to teach the word of God, we need to restore the church to the spiritual, true understanding of the word of God. Right? And so we, we saw that even in the early church, we saw salvation uh, by grace through faith. We looked at water baptism for the believers. right? Uh, uh, and, and these are truths that we all should walk in sanctification holy living understanding and welcoming the work or, and the ministry of the holy spirit now there are times that people may not understand the work of the holy spirit right they may not uh, you know uh, be in tune with what the holy spirit is doing so we as believers have to or leaders have to be open to what the holy spirit is doing the baptism of the holy spirit now uh, there are times when, you know, we may feel that, okay, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is only for the leaders or the pastors or the evangelists and the prophets and all of it. But now we know that it's for all believers. God has poured out his spirit on all flesh, right? So we are part of that. And the gifts of the Holy Spirit growing in the knowledge of his word, uh, 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 victorious Christian living, the uh, roles and the functions of the fivefold ministry beginning to uh, function more powerfully within the church as well, and then equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. So we need to see all of these things uh, abounding in the church. Right? Uh, let's read Ephesians chapter four, verse thirteen. And 14. Uh, can one of us please read that? Ephesians chapter 4, 13 and 14. Yes, sir. <coughs> Till we all come. Go ahead. Go ahead. Any one of them. Any one of them. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slate of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Amen. Thank you, uh, sister. Uh, yeah, so we see here in, Ephes in Ephesians 4, Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, and he's saying, now, once you have believed the truth that we have spoken to you, do not, you know, be tossed about with every wind and doctrine that comes your way, right? Uh, so there will be new things coming up. There will be new doctrines, new dogmas coming up. Remember, Paul is writing to the uh, Thessalonians and he's saying, he's encouraging them. He's saying, listen, it's not yet, the rapture has not yet happened, right? They believe that, you know, the rapture has happened. They were worried. So Paul is writing and he's saying, no. It's not it happened. These are the things that should happen. The revealing of the uh, of the Antichrist and then uh, will come the time of tribulation and then in the twinkling of an eye we will all be changed. 
So Paul is writing to the Thessalonians. Why? Because wrong doctrine came into the church and they believed it. They were not strong in the faith. They were not strong in the truth of the word of God. Uh, of course, later on, Paul writes and he encourages them. And he, that's why he ends Ephesians with chapter six. He says, put on the armor of God so that the works of the enemy uh, will not uh, cause any you know, division within the church, will not break our spirit, will not divert us into a, a, a tangent. And so we need to understand this. Restoration and understanding spiritual truth. Right? Understanding the truth of the word of God in its right sense. Right? Taking a text, and putting it into context. Right? Many people have asked me, especially here in the city that I am in, in Mangalore, they, they don't prefer women to preach. Even, you know, it's kind of surprising for me because now we are in, you know, uh, 2022, the 20th, 21st century, and, you know, things are so open, but yet there are people who say, no, 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 women should not preach. You know, they, they you know, Paul is writing, he's saying women. You see, so I had to sit with them and talk to them and tell them, what is the context of it? Why is he telling that church? Uh, why is he speaking to that church that way? And But then we see that Paul had many women as leaders and Aquila and Priscilla itself were pastoring the church in Rome. So we always need to take text and put context to it. Uh, we remember what Jesus did. You know, the enemy during the temptation episode, the enemy said, you know, take this stone and turn it into bread. Uh, he used the word of God, the enemy. But Jesus took that word and took that text and put it into context. He said, it, yes, it is written, but it is also written that man shall not live by bread alone. Throw yourself down and... Uh, you know, the word of God says that he will send his angels uh, to protect you and to keep you safe. Yes, that's true. But the context, uh, Jesus responds to him and says, but it also says, Do not test the Lord your God. Right? Uh, and so it's very important as a church, we need to see restoration in all of these areas. Right? Uh, restoration in understanding salvation is by grace through faith and all of these things the baptism of the holy spirit the gifts of the holy spirit victorious living um, understanding the ministry of the holy spirit and so we need to teach truth within the church right secondly restoration in the wineskin to contain new wine now as i mentioned that God wants to continuously pour out things, uh, new works into the church, right? When, into the body of Christ. Now, there will be times God is doing something new in a certain place, right? Now, we cannot have old wineskins and, and say, okay, God, uh, you, you, you're doing something, so, uh, you know, uh, I'm not ready for this yet. I'm not ready to receive this yet. Now, here's the thing. As a church, we must be ready with new wineskins as God is pouring out something new. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 17. Can one of us please read that? Matthew 9 and verse 17. Matthew 9 verse 17 says, Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break. The wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Avni. So wineskins are just containers and these containers hold what, you know, hold the wine that is being poured out. So, for example, if, if you've got a wineskin and there's some old wine in it, right? Uh, you know, you don't take the new wine and, okay, anyway, there's very little. So let me just pour this instead of, you know, emptying it out and cleaning it. And let me just pour this uh, new wine into it. We don't do that. Even if we do that, the entire wine is spoiled, right? So 
the wine skin is important because it contains the wine it keeps the wine in a safe um, uh, environment it keeps the wine uh, fresh and what is really important is not only the wine skin but also the wine right so for example we have the wine skin and god is doing something new among us he's pouring out his spirit among us right now we should be willing to let go of certain old things and be ready for god to you know with a new wine skin for god to pour out his his wine now, let me give you this example there was a time uh, when uh, you know worship all of a sudden the worship ministry in the body of christ began to become so strong right uh, i think it was the year uh, 2013 14 globally right god was doing something within the church everywhere there were songs wonderful songs being written and churches would you know see a lot of power during the times of worship they would see healings and deliverance and god was doing something new right uh people would uh, you know I, I, somewhere in the early uh, i forget the year but i think it's early 2010 onwards is when uh but god was doing something new through the worship ministry right people would uh, come in front and you know there would be altar calls many churches would experience a powerful move of god during the times of worship now if we for example god is doing something new and we say no 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 it should only be five songs right we should end with five songs now what happens and that is yes that's important you have an order in service all of that but god is doing something new so we need to let go of the old and god is pouring out something new among us right so wine skins represent structure right the form and the methods and all of it but god is when god is doing something when he is pouring out his spirit in in the church we should be willing to move from one place to another there was a time in the early 19 uh, i think when i was growing up uh, as a little boy i remember going to church nobody lifted their hands in worship nobody nobody would do that right uh, nobody would do that i never saw it maybe uh, you know i grew up in uh, the methodist church but i i never saw that i never saw people raising their voice i never saw expressions of worship um uh, and not like i knew everything but i never saw it but the moment i started to attend uh, these independent churches and i began to realize hey God's doing something new here. People are expressing themselves in worship. People are lifting their hands. They're crying out to God. For me, it was something very new. Uh, maybe for other churches, it's something very new. And and what happens is we need to let go. Uh, we shouldn't say, okay, you know what? I don't lift my hands in worship. Uh, this is how I am. I grew up this way. We need to let go of those old wine skins. right not only for uh, you know i would say not only uh, the church as a whole even in our lives uh, if we need restoration in certain areas we can be open to the holy spirit if we are not used to lifting our hands and worshiping and we are just the same way we can let go of it and say god restore remove this old wine you're doing something new in my life help me to be a new wine skin the church is going from moving from glory to glory so we need to see uh keep developing ourselves we need to keep growing we need new containers we need new wine skins new levels of faith new levels of strength new levels of glory new levels of revelations are brought into the church right and so that's what we want to see even as god is restoring us we want to be the wine skin ready for new wine that god is pouring out so we see that even in uh, all that we studied in church history and the revivals it was something new right god is doing something new in the revivals the last thing we did was william j seymour you know in the azusa street revival 
he doesn't know what's happening people are crying and weeping and uh, you know god is doing something in their midst yet he's uh, you know uh, they were ready to take up what god is doing right? they were ready with new wine skin it was there was there uh, people who were talking against it criticizing it yes but they received what god wanted to do at that moment i believe as a church we should be ready with new wine skin if god is pouring out uh, new wine in the form of revelations we have to receive it if it's through worship if it's through uh, working of miracles we have to be ready right god is able to and so we want to see this kind of restoration in the church right uh, whether it could be a small church a town in a village or it could be a city a church in the city doing very well what we want to see is god moving and we being new wine uh, sorry new wine skins for his glory right um uh, restoration of the fivefold offices unity and fellowship in the spirit amongst leaders and believers across denominational lines i think this is very important now many years back it was like okay the pentecost they are there the methodists they are there the uh, you know the uh, uh, baptists they are here and so it's always been this denomination i think this whole thing of denominations has really hit and uh, you know cause a lot of problems within the church now hey which denomination you are in which do you know a lot of divisions i think as a church if we break these denominational barriers we will be able to accomplish more for the kingdom of god remember this one time uh, uh there was a there was a pastor that i met and he's a methodist pastor uh and he said uh, can you come and share he has a small church and so he said can you come and share i said yes sure i can come uh and then i prepared on the holy spirit and what the holy spirit does the working of the holy spirit and i went there there were about 100 young people and a few families and began to you know uh, teach this and everything went on well we finished uh, this teaching and you know at the end of that whole event the you know the believers who were there said no we never heard this kind of teaching we never knew that the holy spirit works this way and so the pastor also mentioned told me that you know we need to stop these differences because this is the word of god and this whole thing of you know the holy spirit is not there he's there all of this we the word of god is what you have shared is through the word of god and so we must believe it and there was such a sense of unity at that time we never felt that okay he's methodist or he's uh, you know we never felt any division we felt like we were one one body and so that's what we want to see we want to see these breaking downs of walls breaking down of barriers and denominations yes there will be times when you know god is uh, working something in certain denominations that's okay but that does not mean that we we say okay this is not for you this is only for us no we need to be open to what god is doing what we receive freely we receive freely just give it to others uh, and be a blessing so one of the other important things that we want to see in terms of restoration is the fivefold offices right uh, ephesians chapter 4 11 and 12 paul is writing uh, to the church in ephesus he's saying he's talking about the fivefold ministry that is the evangelist the pastor the teacher the prophet uh, the apostle right he's saying these the fivefold ministry has to function in its power so uh, okay uh, charles uh, we are on page 77 right uh, we're talking about in chapter 6 the second point restoration in the wine skin to contain new wine right so restoration of the fivefold offices there was a time when these the fivefold ministry was functioning powerfully in the early church we see that in the book of acts but during the dark ages we see 
that this fivefold ministry was completely dampened. There was no fivefold ministry at all, right? But now, after some time, after the dark ages, we see that the fivefold ministry is getting back its place. The ministry functions are, uh, uh, you know, uh, are getting accepted and established uh, in the church. Now, these ministries need to be fully restored in the church. Now, here's the problem that we see, that I personally have seen. With the restoration of the fivefold ministry, you've got the evangelists, you've got the prophets, the, uh, you know, uh, the, the apostles and all of it. With the restoration of all of this, one of the things that is prominent in the church is this whole thing of, you know, stardom kind of a attitude. Yes, God used mighty men of God, uh, Oral Roberts, Billy Graham, uh, uh, Renard Bonke, wonderful evangelists, pastors like Kenneth Hagen, Derek Prince, uh, prophets again, Kenneth Hagen and uh, DGS Dinakaran, uh, and uh, apostles like Randy Clark, Bill Johnson. So we see the restoration of the fivefold ministry. But one of the dangers that we see right now that we should be very careful of is the whole thing of stardom. Right? Hey, I am the prophet. Nobody should come near me. If you come near me, my anointing will leave. Or I am the apostle. Or I am the great evangelist. Now, as God is bringing restoration in this fivefold ministry, it is our responsibility to be good stewards of what God is doing. The moment we take what God is doing and make it a whole thing of, you know, stardom and make it a whole thing of, you know, uh, uh, money making business or uh, a whole thing of, you know, uh, being, you're making it big, right? Then what happens is we miss the big picture. The focus goes on the person or the preacher rather than Jesus Christ. I've seen plenty of these things that are happening within the church. And so we need to pray, God, restore the fivefold function. Yes, God is restoring it, but we need to be good stewards of that restoration. Right? Uh, uh, we, we cannot have people, you know, uh, prophets and apostles. God is gracious. God is merciful. Even through our failures, he works in and through us. We need to be good stewards, right? Uh, uh, for example, you got, you know, nowadays when you look around in church, you got these big prophets, you know, they come, they come on the stage, they finish their preaching or the, uh, the whole meeting, and they just, you know, car comes, they go sit in the car and they're gone. Nobody knows where they are. Nobody knows how, you know, what their life is. So it's all this whole thing of stardom. We need to break that. Right? We need to break that barrier. We need to break those kind of attitudes and humble ourselves and say, God, move among us. Right? When we see in the first century church, the prophets, the apostles, the teachers, the pastors, everyone worked in unity and they worked in humility. Right? There was no, you know, big things. I'll give you this example. It's, it's a funny example, but it's it really happened. It's happened uh, many years back. Uh, I happened to go to this place for a conference and it, it was like a two days conference. And, uh, and so uh, it was, you know, session after session after session. And so there were many uh, preachers come from different places. And so it's, at, the worship was going on one morning and uh, another preacher had to come. And during the worship time, uh, suddenly there was a big sound and people started, you know, like, you know, drumming and uh, dancing on the road. And uh, so I was wondering what is happening. And we saw, uh, and later on I realized that it is the prophet who's entering the auditorium or the tent of meeting and they were putting garlands on him and throwing flowers on the ground and he was walking with his jacket and his sunglasses and uh, 
I was there, the worship is going on. Nobody's listening to the worship, but everyone's eye is going to what's happening at the back. And this man, apparently he's a great prophet, and he came and he stood there, uh, you know, right on the first row, he stood, and uh, people are, you know, he had some bodyguards, or I don't know who they were, but people are coming and asking for photos. Now, this is during the worship is going on, during the worship time. Right, the worship team is singing, and this is all happening. People are coming to take. Can I take a photo? With you? And I thought to myself, what is happening? And then he refused. After some time, he refused to go on stage because he said, only if there are five hundred, six hundred people, I will preach. Otherwise, I will not preach. So that day, I think there were about two hundred odd people. And he said, where is the my photo on the banner? of the you know the conference my photo is not there and so i remember the pastor was you know handling the whole conference said no we are not put any photos of anyone we just put the name of the conference he felt offended he said no i don't want to preach so he just did one session and he went away and it was it was so bad to look at and i just thought to myself what if there were new you know people who were just coming to experience god wanting to, you know, they've come in tears. Many of them are broken families. Many of them are hurt. They're looking for healing. They're looking for truth. Many were not even believers. They're just there for the first time. What would they think seeing all of this? Right? I believe that we are responsible for what we do in the church. Uh, you know, we are responsible. We need to steward. The reason they are like that is because we have given them that kind of, yes, we are to honor God's people. We need to respect them. But there's a line. There's a way that we do that. Right? And so as we see restoration in the fivefold ministry, for it, for the fivefold ministry to be powerful, we need to walk in humility. We need to walk in humility. Right? This one time, oh, uh, I forget, I think we were at uh, in North India in a place called Nasik. Uh, and then we, we went there. It was a conference for about, uh, I think about 500 odd pastors, two days conference, we were teaching on kingdom builders. And so during that conference, um, you know, the actually they expected about 300 odd people. This is in 2013, I guess. Uh, uh, and, and and our pastoral team, we few of us went uh, through with the pastorals, and we ex ex expected about three hundred people, but five hundred odd turned up, and so um, you know it was kind of a you know a lot of arrangement needed to be done with chairs and food and all of it, and then so everyone tried to put their hand and help, and so this one time it was the lunch time. And people finished, eat, there were some people who finished eating and they left the plates there. And I'll never forget this. Uh, and so I was standing in the line with the plate, uh, you know, just going to go get food. And this man comes up and he says, oh, come here, you know, go and wash the plates. Uh, I said, okay, brother. And I went, and he said, no, I am not brother. I am apostle. You, see, you know, uh, you see my name on the tag. I said, okay, apostle. Uh, I will do what you ask me to do. So I went and I began washing the plates. Uh, doesn't matter to us because, you know, one of the things we learned in APC is to do the smallest of things, no matter what. We learn to do our own things. Even in Bible college, we do our own stuff. So it doesn't matter. It didn't matter to me. So yeah, okay, began to wash the plates and all of it. And then he said, go and wash the glasses there. And not only me, but there were a few other people as well. And so we did that. And because, you know, there were 500 people, so we had to replenish the plates. So we did all of that. And, and then I stood back in the line and, uh, you know, we finished the uh, lunch break. That was the afternoon session. And the first session in the afternoon was my session. So uh, I, I went in front and I began to just teach. Uh, 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 we did a, about, I think it was a one-hour session. We did a one-hour session, took a 15, took a break. Then this pastor came up to me and he said, oh, I didn't know you're from Bangalore. I didn't know you're the, uh, come from the pastoral team. You're, pre, you're teaching in the thing. I said, that's okay, uh, apostle. It's okay. It doesn't matter. right? The point is the things need to be get done. He said, no, no, no. Then I began to realize, I told him, it's all right. Calm down. You know, 
we're all working together. But I realized one thing. I realized that the reason we are like this, like, you know, we have this whole thing of apostle, prophet, the, the, the title is because sometimes we gain, we want to gain recognition from people than God. We worried about what people think than what God thinks, right? So the reason I'm sharing this is this is happening not only in our nation, but everywhere and it's happening. Uh, when you, you know, especially when the ministry is small, nothing, you know, you don't feel anything. But as the ministry is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, we need to guard ourselves. Say, God, you are working. You are restoring the fivefold ministry. Let it glorify you. Then we see unity and fellowship in the spirit across denominations. You know, there will be critics. There will be people who will, you know, uh, you know, mock and, and cause divisions. We need to as God's people, we need to tear down denominations. Now, the mistake we make is if we don't agree with some denominations, we tend to, you know, talk against it or, you know, publicly speak against it. You know, this is what they're doing wrong. This is what they should do. You know, you know they're doing this way. Their worship is like this. It's so, you know, their word is like this. Remember what Jesus did, so beautiful. Jesus said, we shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Right? You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. So instead of mocking others, instead of putting them down, just speak the truth. Right? Speak the truth. The truth will set you free. Now God has given me wonderful opportunities. I've preached in charismatic Catholic churches. I've preached in Catholic churches. I've preached in Methodist and Baptist churches, Calvinistic churches. Um, I don't go. We we are not to go there and bash their theology and say this is wrong. This is this is wrong. Just go there, speak the truth, and let the truth set them free. Right, uh, and so we need to cause unity of fellowship within the church rather than denominations. You know, break down these denominations, right? Uh, of course, we may have different styles. Every church has different essence, uh, but let it not be a hindrance for the work of God, right? Then we see the release of movements that help form new wineskin churches. When we looked at how in even the uh, church history that we saw the revival times during these revivals God is pouring out his new wine new movements began to take place right new churches began to be formed just some of them the Pentecostal movement uh, in the early 1900s emphasized the baptism of the Holy Spirit now are they important very important right until that time you know uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit okay you know Holy Spirit is there uh, or some of them believed he's not even there. But the Pentecostal movement brought the assemblies of God, you know, they, they began speaking in tongues. They began, you know, uh, 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 emphasizing that the Holy Spirit is able to do it. Right? And so the Pentecostal movement, then the latter rain moment, that every believer can manifest the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And you got the word of faith moment, encouraging the believers, hey, you pray. Have faith in God. God is able to bring healing. God is able to bring deliverance. Right? Charismatic moment, encouraging believers to flow in the gifts of the Spirit. The Jesus movement, accepting people for who they are. Remember the Jesus movement? We studied that. The hippies, the, the those who are, you know, uh, drug addicts and uh, living in sinful lives, they've got to know Jesus. And so they expect accepting them. The Jesus movement accepted them for who they are. And even now we we've come to a place where if we see people with tattoos, maybe earlier on we say, like, "Oh, he's got tattoos. He, you know, he's a sinner." Now we're open to that, right? It's not like we're saying go get tattoos done and come to the church. But what we're trying to say is, they may have got tattoos done before, and we're just accepting them. Right? It's not about the tattoos. It's about their life that's at stake. So the charismatic movement, 
was more open. The Jesus movement, the worship movement, you know, the new styles of worship, uh, vineyard songs, integrity music, Maranatha music, new styles of worship, right? Um, and then the church growth movement, how God used David, Pastor David Yonggi Cho uh, through these you know, small groups and uh, what he did uh, you know, in the prayer mountain and starting these small prayer groups, resulting in a huge impact in the church, bringing thousands of people uh, to church. And so many of the ministries have replicated what uh, David, Pastor David Yonggi Cho did, and they did see the fruit. I, many a places, uh, you know, many a sermons that I've heard of uh, Pastor David Paul Yonggi Cho, where he says that, uh, you know, he he goes to these churches and teaches them how to have cell groups and how they can, you know, uh, be effective in cell groups and how churches which are just 50, 60 grew to 200, 300 people very quickly. So we see that people did take up uh, these movements and work with it. Now, I'm not saying that it will work everywhere, right? But it does work, right? Then we see uh, now, even now, the ongoing marketplace ministry where ministry is done among the marketplace, the spheres of influence, the IT sector, uh, business, uh, trade, and all these other things, government, arts and entertainment, media, ministry is being done touching lives through all these places. So we see that as God is releasing his move, as God is releasing the, the work of the Holy Spirit, we need to be ready with new wineskin. Let's not stick on and say, okay, no, this is how I am. This is what I learned when I was in Sunday school. And so this is what I will stick on to. No, God is teaching us something new be open to it, right? Just two more points quickly. Restoration of in God's people pursuing God's purpose, right? Even Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, the fivefold ministry, it was the Lord's intent that we be equipped for the ministry so that the church is built up, right? Now, as God calls us, right, each one of us, you know, we are in the Bible college, we are learning, what are we doing? We're equipping ourselves. Right? Even we as you know, teachers and you know, ministering in the church and all of it, what are we doing? We also, we can't say, okay, now I have achieved, I have become a pastor, uh, uh, done it, I've achieved everything that I wanted to achieve. No, it's a learning process. We continue to pursue God. We continue to ask God for new things in our lives. So progressive uh, revelation, uh, progressive pursuing of God's purposes. Right? Uh, the moment we come to a place where we say, okay, I've, I've done what God has wants me to do, and we take a back seat, we'll see that, you know, uh, somewhere we will lose focus on what God wants us to do. Remember what Proverbs says, uh, a, a man that lacks vision uh, will fail. Right? So we need to have a purpose. We need to continue with that purpose. Uh, this whole thing of clergy and laity, okay, these, this place is for the clergy, meaning pastors, apostles, prophets, and these are believers. So the believers have to listen to the prophets and the pastors. Now, that whole thing of clergy and laity has been, you know, is is getting wiped away. Everyone are one in unity. And uh, we want to see that happening. And then finally, restoration in the church's impact to the world. And God is calling us to be salt and light. Right? Uh, the church should impact the world and not the world impacting the church. That's what we saw in the revivals. Right? We saw in all the revivals, the church was impacting the world. The church, people are wondering what's happening. Why are people, why is the shops closed? Why are, uh, um, you know, why is business shut down? Why? Because they're all sitting in the church, crying and weeping. The church should be able to impact the world. You and I are the church. You and I are to impact the world. 
Now we, we may think, oh, how can I be, how can I, I'm just an insignificant person. Uh, you know, maybe I don't know anybody or I'm just a homemaker or I'm just, you know, I'm just, uh, I have a, I'm just serving in the church. I'm in the volunteer team in the church. Remember, it's one heart at a time, right? It's one heart that you and I can touch. And that one heart can touch a hundred others. So one heart at a time. It's all right. right? No matter what, whether it's one or whether it's hundred or whether it's thousands, we as a church are to impact the world. That's when we will see the restoration of the church as a whole. So these are the points. I hope um, we've been able to take a, a few takeaways from this uh, lesson. Uh, any questions? I know we passed our time. Any questions? If any questions? Any thoughts anyone has? Okay. All right. Uh, is it okay? Are you all able to understand? Uh, because I, I've been talking the whole session. Maybe what we can do is we can also leave it open next class, next week. We will just leave it open, have some time for discussion, take thoughts from each other, and then we can uh, you know, start the next session with that time of discussion as well. All right, great. Uh, let's just close in prayer. Uh, one of us lead us. Uh, Bula, can you please close in prayer? Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we want to thank you and praise you, Father, for this time, Lord, of learning. Father, we thank you so much, Father, for this message, Lord, that we have heard, the teaching that we have heard, Lord. This brings great encouragement and great stirring of our hearts, so God, to seek you, God, to hunger more, Lord, so that we could see that restoration happen, oh God. And Lord, that we could see the work of the Holy Spirit, O oh God, that we could see, Father, that change that we could bring about, O oh Father, in this world that is so filled with darkness. Lord, as you have promised, Lord, that the glory is going to come, Lord, in the last days, Father. Lord, the word promised to us in Isaiah 60, when the darkness increases and grows, darkness is going to be upon the people, Lord. But the promise of the Lord is the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you this is our time lord as a church oh god to come to the fullness of restoration lord and to bring that impact to this world father when the church today is so diluted lord and the world has brought its influence inside the church we just pray for the fire of the holy spirit oh god and the light of your presence to shine in amidst so greatly lord and the glory to be upon us so strong and so greatly lord manifesting father god so in a mighty way that the world would see as your word says in isaiah 60 the gentiles will come to your light and the kings to the brightness of your rising. So we pray, may you give, get all the glory and honor and praise, Father, in all that is going to happen in the coming days and that which you plan to accomplish in us and through us, Father. So we want to surrender our lives afresh and say, Lord, here we are. God, do your work in us, O oh, Father. We thank you, we praise you, we give you all the glory and honor. In the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. We pray blessings upon Pastor Paul, O oh Lord. He's been a great blessing to us. So we thank you so much, Father. We pray blessing upon him, Father. In the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus, we pray, Father. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Beulah. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a wonderful week ahead. God bless you all. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. God bless. Thank you.